Right, okay, so what I want to do today, what I want to do today is I want to turn to Spengler's discussion of science. Um, science plays a significant part in Spengler's work, particularly his early work, uh, which is what I will be focusing on. Um, I want to give you the key features of his views of science, which I think are quite peculiar, uh, quite, quite unique um, to, to Spengler, and also which I would argue precede uh, major developments in the philosophy of science in the mid and late 20th century. Having sketched out Spengler's views on science, I then want to move on to compare his work with that of another German philosopher, Hans Feihinger. And I want to make the argument that we should view Spengler in his views on science as a fictionalist. Yeah, I, I will clarify what all these things mean as I go along. Um, and then I will suggest that once you accept, or if you accept my argument that Spengler is a fictionalist, it offers us a different way of reading his historical corpus. That, that's, that's the grand plan. Right, so what I have here on the wall is what I hope is a not terribly contentious uh, outline of the key features of um, Spengler's thought. Certainly, um, I, I've established this by looking at a variety of secondary commentaries on Spengler, and even the most virulent opponents, um, in terms of interpretation, I think would agree upon these key features, that he has a cyclical model, uh, he talks about cultural organisms, uh, he talks about destiny as kind of a driving force of historical uh, change, he has a cultural isolation theory, so that each culture is someone's described as like, like, a, like a monad. Uh, completely self-contained, um, and also that history um, has no particular meaning. There is no grand plan, yeah? That, that the hand of God is not revealed with the passage of historical time. Righty-ho. So, on to Spengler's philosophy of science. Now, philosophy of science, sorry, science in general for Spengler is very, very important. And if you want evidence for this, I will just put it to you, and I'm not being original here, I'm quoting from Domenico Conte in his, his introduction to, to Spengler. He says, look, how does Spengler introduce his eyes thought in Decline of the West? He starts with mathematics. How does he end Decline of the West, volume one? With physics. He bookends his entire narrative with science. Doesn't that suggest its importance in his thought? And if you read through um, the Decline, particularly volume one, constant references back to science all the way through. So science was clearly important to Spengler. Spengler himself kept abreast of the latest developments in modern science at that time, which was going through radical changes uh, in, in the Weimar period. So um, I think a, a reason why people tend not to look at Spengler's science um, is because they think it's going to basically be the application of his philosophy of history to science. Yeah? So every culture has an awe symbol, that shapes every other form of cultural expression, um, each culture is cut off from another culture, and that's what his science is going to be as well. Yeah? Um, well, it is, no, to give you a, a kind of clear philosophical position, it is and it isn't. I shall explain why. Right, so key features of Spengler's philosophy of science. He says each culture has its own science. But having a science is an essential feature of each culture. Yeah? He says that every science <clears throat> theory is necessarily preceded by techniques. Technique. You always get technology before you get science. This is a view which has been accepted in the philosophy of technology only in recent years. That technology precedes science. <laughs> okay. Um, Spengler also argues that science is essentially mathematical in nature. Again, this is a common feature uh, of science across cultures. And he also says that scientific knowledge cannot be transmitted between cultures. This is Spengler's famous cultural isolation theory. <clears throat> okay, right. However, um, Spengler does say there are certain peculiarities of Faustian science. It was one of Gilbert Melio's criticisms of Spengler on science, that because Spengler has this one-size-fits-all model of cultures and sciences, that he can't do justice to the uniqueness of Western science. Whereas I don't think, I, I, I dislike disagreeing with Melio, but I, I don't think he's quite right on that one, because I think that Spengler is quite clear in his early work that there is something unique about Faustian science. So there are structural similarities, but Faustian is different from all the other ones, and the reason for this is because the Faustian or symbol is unique. Now, if you think about the or symbols, most of the or symbols for cultures are static. Yeah? The, the Russian one of the endless plane or what have you. The Faustian or symbol is dynamic. It embodies a concept of motion. Now, you might say, all right, but don't the... Um, 
<clears throat> the Chinese or symbol and the Egyptian or symbol also have a concept of motion. Well, yes, they do. But here's the big difference. The difference is that it's a movement between two points. Yeah, the destination is set when you start to start in motion along the Egyptian or symbol or with the um, <clears throat> um, or with the other one I mentioned. I've just forgotten. Whereas the Faustian one has no destination. It is infinite movement across infinite space at all points at once. The very point of the or symbol, which, which defines all cultural activity for um, Faustian study, is endlessly dynamic without a resting point. That's what's unique about it, and that's what shapes its science, I will suggest. Okay, <clears throat> so what of this in practice? Well, I don't have time to go into uh, Spengler's philosophy of science in detail, unfortunately, um, but he comes up with a series of fascinating concepts which precede um, their, their popularization in the 60s and 70s um, in the philosophy of science. Spengler, for example, argues for the theory lateness of observation. He says that you cannot have neutral observations of scientific practice or phenomena or anything. They are always colored by what, what we now call the paradigm, the scientific paradigm that you happen to hold. <clears throat> he argues for incommensurability. It is simply the case that people speaking science from different cultural paradigms are, 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 are incapable of communicating. There is a barrier between the two. He um, erases the distinction between context of discovery and context of justification by focusing rigorously on the notion of scientific practice in his account of how science works. <clears throat> now you have to bear in mind that Spengler's writing this at the same time logical positivism is starting off, which rigorously enforces, well, there's, there's the history of what scientists did and there's the, there's the pure epistemological theory of what they do. And Spengler happily blurs this in a way that didn't become popularized until later on with people like Kuhn and Bachelard and so on and so forth. <clears throat> he comes up with an idea of what um, Collingwood would call absolute, absolute presuppositions, or what Wittgenstein, who was influenced by Spengler, would call hinge presuppositions. The idea that the basis of every single science are concepts that you cannot question. You have to have these concepts to function. Yeah? You can't pick at them or the whole house of cards falls over. And he also, when he explains about the development of modern science, changes in scientific theory, he appeals to external as well as internal factors. He talks about the consequences of the professionalization of German science, the transition from individual inventors to mass industrial processes. And he accounts for all of this in his philosophy of science. <clears throat> Again, which, which precedes developments in the philosophy of science uh, by, by a number of decades. Right, what do we want to take away from all of this? What's particularly important? is that for Spengler, all scientific theory, without exception, has an irreducible metaphysical component derived from the or symbol of a culture. Yeah? In many ways, science for each culture is the purest expression of the or symbol. Because what a science is and its birth in theory is the inhabitant of a culture reflecting upon their own cultural mandates given by the or symbol. Consequently, I will suggest all scientific theory for Spengler is fictional. It does not track objective reality. It is not a grasp on the real. It is a subjective expression of the worldview given to a culture by the or symbol. Okay. <clears throat> now, why, why did I start thinking about this? Um, I, I was reading um, Melio one time. I think it was a paper of his in Spengler Heute. And he just throws out this one line. I can get to it, uh, where he says, oh yeah, look, um, obviously Spengler is a Weihungarian fictionalist, and then moves on. He just does nothing with it. He just threw it away. Now, at the same time, I just relieve, uh, received my copy of Ich bin ein Jeden der Lebt, again by Melia, which had just come out, and I was reading this particular passage, and it kind of got me thinking that, that maybe fictionalism was one way of trying to understand what, what Spengler was up to. <clears throat> okay, so what is fictionalism? Um, fictionalism is a philosophy of science that basically says you can't ever really know the fundamental, fundamental nature of a reality. All we can ever know are systems of thought that we have constructed ourselves. Now, obviously, um, <clears throat> we assume that our fictions are successful because they correspond to reality, but we don't know that. You can't help yourself to that kind of knowledge. Now, there are two different kinds of fictionalism. There's what you might call eliminative fictionalism, like the uh, Vienna Circle practiced. Yeah? Find a fiction, it's a fiction, fictions are bad, kill the fiction. Only the empirical must survive. 
And then you have people like Feihinger who go, hey, no, fic we need fictions, they're useful. Don't be frightened of fictions, just run with the fictions. <clears throat> How am I doing for time? Very well. Oh, sweet. Okay, right. <clears throat> yes, okay, so um, this is the Melio quote I was talking about. As a student of Hans Feihinger, Spengler asserted that any theory or any science is merely a more or less fruitful fiction. Okay. Um, so I got thinking about this, um, and then I began researching um, Feihinger. And what I discovered that I thought was quite interesting is when you trawl through most of the biographies of Spengler, they'll tell you he was here, he was there, he met these people. I knew he'd got the, the, some kind of prize at the same time that Feihinger had got one. I hadn't realized that he'd been at university when, when Feihinger was there. Um, <clears throat> and then what I actually engaged with um, after reading the Melio comment um, uh, Feihinger's great work, The Philosophy of As If, the similarities between his work and Spengler became just ridiculously, uh, ridiculously striking. <clears throat> Let me try and explain in more detail. Right, okay. <clears throat> right, um, Feihinger, like Spengler, is developing a philosophical anthropology, trying to explain the origins of human consciousness, how it is we have ideas about the world, how it is we developed theories of science, and, and what their fundamental nature is. Now, this is a significant component in the first volume of Decline of the West, which tends to get overlooked. I think particularly in the English-speaking world, when they got hold of a copy of The Decline, they, got, they read through it and they went, oh, history, we like history, ugh, German metaphysics. They threw that bit out and then they carried on with, with the rest of the book. If you read the metaphysical bit, which for me is the important bit, um, you, you have this fascinating worldview from the very bottom up that Spengler provides for everyone. <clears throat> so what I want to do here is kind of uh, compare Feihinger and Spengler's um, uh, views on the origins of consciousness and the nature of science. Why? Two reasons. One, if Spengler does correspond closely, which I argue he does, to Feihinger, and Feihinger, we would all agree, I hope, is a card-carrying fictionalist, yeah? then that suggests that Spengler himself is a fictionalist. Second possibility which I want to float is that there probably is a direct influence of one upon the other, but that's less important. So, <clears throat> both Feihinger and Spengler um, offer a philosophical anthropological account of the formation of human consciousness. According to both thinkers, early humans find themselves in the world surrounded by a, a welter, a chaos of sense impressions, which provoke a kind of primal fear in us. In response to that fear, to enable the organism to function and survive, consciousness is developed. And it's usually based by fundamental dualities. So an inner and an outer. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> noumena phenomena. Us and them. It's, it's, it's always in a binary. But it's a construct. It's not natural to human beings. And likewise, reason for both um, Feihinger and for Spengler is not an innate feature of human beings. It is something we have organisms, us all going to have adapted. We have developed for its practical utility. God did not give us reason. We are not born with reason. We do not use reason for truth. We evolved reason. We adapted reason to become more successful organisms. <clears throat> it's a biological response to sensory data. And we have it not because it's true, but because it's useful. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? Um, Feihinger and Spengler both have a rather peculiar notion of what understanding means. For both of them, um, consciousness and rationality are a series of what you might call ideational structures, to use, uh, to use Feihinger's term. And these things are subjectively created. They do not, they're not given us by the world, they're things we develop out of ourselves. So when we say we understand something, what that actually means, according to Feihinger and Spengler too, I would suggest, is that by using analogy, we subsume some new sense data under an ideational structure that we already have. Yeah? And this is what understanding is. Now, this, uh, Feihinger is explicit on this, this is the way understanding works. I think this explains Spengler, and I particularly think this explains the cultural isolation theory. Why is it that Spengler tells us that the, the inhabitant of one culture can never understand the inhabitant of another culture? 
There seems to be no obvious reason for it. And then he gives examples of pseudomorph blah, pseudomorphosis and things which seem to suggest there were some levels of cultural understanding. Well, if his notion of understanding follows Feihinger's, it's because to understand something is to suck it up and slot it into my ideational structure, thereby transforming it. So what I then understand, I have actually created, I have transformed, I have adapted to my own worldview. So whilst it might seem that intercultural communication is taking place, all I'm doing is picking up ciphers, symbols, giving them my own meaning from my own ideational structure, mm -hmm. and then absorbing them. Yeah, a further point, <clears throat> if this is the way understanding operates in Feihinger and Spengler, is that understanding is always subjective, because what we do, we achieve sense data and we give it meaning by linking it by analogy to a structure, an internal structure, which we've already invented ourselves or absorbed from our culture. At no point in time does objective reality make an appearance in this picture, giving any particular meaning to, to, the, to the thing understood or the system of understanding in the first place. Yeah? Human beings, human cultures are in an endless loop of their own subjectivity, which in Spengler's case is structured by the or symbol, uh, which operates as a, as a kind of a, a Kantian intuition for, uh, for, for Spengler anyway. Okay, <clears throat> further implications. For both Feihinger and Spengler, and they are explicit on this, all science is fictional, for obvious reasons now. If all understanding is, is fictional, then science is kind of the, the, the ultimate form of understanding is also going to be fictional. And this includes mathematics. Now, it's a common feature now, if you read um, relativist philosophers of science, they'll say, yes, all biology is relative, and yes, all physics is relative, or oh, not mathematics. Mathematics is real, <laughs> yeah? Suddenly I'm a Platonist. When I was saying I had to work out what time it was, I, I became a Platonist again and numbers are real things out there in the universe. Weihinger and Spengler are absolutely adamant on this point. Mathematics is fictional. And for Spengler this is particularly important because what Spengler says is when primitive humanity is there facing the world and all this raw sense data and struggles to develop ideational structures to cope, yeah, number. Number is the ultimate weapon against the chaos and disorder of reality. Yeah? You number things, you enumerate them, you put boundaries around them, and then you name them and that gives you control. So for Spengler, in particular, mathematics is always metaphysical. It's a structure that you lay out on the world before you come to the world, so the world is interpretable by you, before you get to it. Science, for both Feihinger and Spengler, mathematics, physics, what have you, is always and everywhere an ideational structure. Something that humans have invented for the purposes of utility. Utility was always the point. Truth was not the point. Truth itself is an extremely useful series of fictions that allow us to survive, propagate the species, navigate the world, and, and, and live in a moderately comfortable way. Now, so what? is the big question um, here. How am I doing for time? Uh, Sweet. <coughs> cool, cool, cool. Sure. Um, look, so um, I hope I have demonstrated that one Spengler has uh, what I would call the philosophy of science, uh, if not certainly peculiar views on science that are, are worthy of discussion and consideration in their own right. Um, I also want to suggest, and hopefully I've demonstrated, that Spengler is a fictionalist about science, possibly due to the influence of Feihinger, maybe not, but either way he clearly is a fictionist. What's that got to do with the broader picture of Spengler? Well, I'm going to get kind of tentative here, but, but this is my suggestion. If you look at the secondary commentary on Spengler, um, it's, there is a continuous debate going on in Spengler scholarship about how to understand Spengler's historical claims. And you can categorize practically every single commentator um, from H. Stuart Hughes to John Farenkopf into one of two camps. They either read Spengler as a positivist of some sort, or they read Spengler as a relativist of some sort. Now, there are different permutations, but these are the two camps. What do I mean by this? A positivist reading of Spengler would say something like, um, there are laws of history, and these are universally true and universally valid and they are discoverable. So historical truth with a capital T is a possibility. On the other hand, you have the relativist interpretation, 
that says universal truth is an impossibility, universal historical truth is an impossibility, you can never understand other cultures, you can barely understand your own culture, um, history is, is a kind of a, an aesthetic phenomena we enjoy as an expression of our own cultural spirit. <clears throat> and, and these two camps uh, are, are kind of locked in, a, in an endless conflict, and the reason I suggest why neither side has been able to um, secure the dominance of its interpretation is that both these elements are present in Spengler's thought. Such that it's not possible to just explain away the recalcitrant data because it clearly is the case that Spengler sometimes does talk about universal laws and does talk as if there's a possibility of, of, of her historical truth with a capital T. And it is the case that we can program in a scientific way the path of future civilization more travel. That, so against the relativist, there's always the, the rump of the positivist Spengler, I think mainly in chapter three of volume one, that you just can't seem to get rid of, yeah? But then, of course, to the positivist, they have to explain away lots of statements like, well, you know, we can never understand different cultures, um, everything is perspectival, um, look, you know, hell, we, don't, we see things differently in different cultures, we even see things differently in different cultures depending how old the culture is. So even within a culture, you have variation in perspective between its youth and its senescence. So the, the positivist ha can't explain away this vast amount of relativist content in Spengler either. So what do I suggest we do about it? Well, <laughs> what you could do, option one, is to excise the bits you don't like. Yeah? If you're a relativist, chop out the positivist bits. If you're a positivist, chop out the relativist bits. But the problem is this does violence to Spengler's theory. And I ask you to imagine um, you imagine the popular understanding of Spengler, which is usually based just upon the decline of the West. Imagine it for a second. And then imagine you've hacked at all the best about universal laws and recurrent cycles. Would that be Spengler anymore? I would suggest no. Or if you're on a relativist, or sorry, a positivist strand and you hack at all the relativist content about the impossibility of cultural communication, uh, about, about the singularity and the all-purpose of the or symbol, which, which gives you a world and locks you in that world. Would that be Spengler? No. So cutting either of them out doesn't work. Now, of course, there is then the historian's response, you see? Because I'm a philosopher. I want consistency. <laughs> I want Spengler to make sense. I want to believe that when Spengler sat down to write his magnum opus he'd been planning for years, that he knew what the hell he was doing. <laughs> Didn't just go, I'm feeling positivist today. No, I'm feeling rather, oh, I'm so changeable and sensitive. I don't want that to be the case. Now, <laughs> possibly. Um, now, the historian's response to this sort of thing is to go, look, Spengler was a person, people are complicated, sometimes they just write bad books. Deal with it. <laughs> You're trying to bring order, there was no order, he was just a bad writer. Yeah, that, that, here we go. I, I dislike that theory as well, for obvious reasons. It seems to me, if you accept my argument that Spengler was a fictionalist about science, it raises the possibility that he was a fictionalist about everything else as well. Yeah? Now, if Spengler was a fictionalist, then it seems to me we have a possible way, and this is just a suggestion now at the end, of resolving the apparent contradiction. Because if Spengler is a fictionalist, then what you would have in Decline of the West aren't a, isn't a contradictory theory, it's two separate theories. One of which he actually believed to be an accurate account of the nature of the world, and the other one was a fiction designed to serve a certain purpose, perhaps in persuading the public, perhaps in winning scientific credibility, or what have you. But it seems to me it holds at a possibility of resolving the contradiction without having to lobotomize Spengler in some way by removing the content we don't like. And I think I will stop there. Thank you.